to support and encourage locals who are thinking about a career in the law. It does this by organizing uh, several weeks of intensive classes that are designed to simulate the first few years of law school. Um, this requires uh, flying out to professors from the mainland to teach these classes. And uh, in order to give the broader community, not just the students, a chance to learn about the law and interact with professors, we have also organized this Law and the Community Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture is the third of, fourth, a third of four lectures. The fourth and final lecture will be this Thursday at noon at the uh, Guma Ustitia in Suzuki. Uh, before we begin, just two quick things. First of all, I know it's common sense, but please silence your cell phones. Last time someone's cell phone was ringing, it was a little annoying, so let's try to, let's hope that doesn't happen again. Um, the second thing, the pre-law program and the law and the lecture series have been generally supported by the uh, Northern Islands Humanities Council. We thank the council for their support. At the very end of the program, I will be handing out some short uh, surveys. Please take a minute and uh, fill them out. Now, without further ado, um, uh, our speaker tonight has come a long way, uh, come home from Saipan. She's come all the way from uh, New Jersey, where she served as the interim dean of Rutgers Law School. Please give a warm welcome to Rose Pizan Gilizzo. Thank you so much. Justice. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm so excited to speak with many of you about an issue that has drawn quite a lot of attention recently. And while the topic focuses on citizenship in American Samoa, my hope is to be able to engage with you on how these cases I'll be talking about, both historically, but also currently, how they, uh, what their implications are for the Mariana Islands. And so to begin, here's just a brief outline of what I will be talking about tonight. First, I'll give a brief overview of how citizenship is acquired, including here in the U.S. territory, one of the U.S. territories. Second, I'll discuss the insular cases, and some of you might be familiar with it, having written about it in law school, um, also studied it in, um, in law school perhaps, or since then, and certainly my students who are here, you had to read the insular cases in class. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, my hope is to get, just provide a brief background on the insular cases. And then I'll talk about some of the efforts to overrule the insular cases, and some of the underlying reasons why that might be the case. And finally, I'll talk about what the implications are for the CNMI. What would a post-insular cases, cases America look like for, for all of us? And so to begin, uh, who can tell me? So one of the things in law school, as many of you know, is that there are some um, uh, engagement with students. Who can tell me uh, what are the ways in which one can acquire U.S. citizenship? All right, Mr. Mapnas. Born in the U.S. Or All right. Okay, good. So one born in the U.S. in the in the U.S. territories or in a U.S. state. What else? How else? Yes, Ms. Gow. Naturalization. Naturalization. Great. Okay. So birth or naturalization, two different ways, right, of acquiring U.S. <laughs> citizenship, either by being born, as you can see, there's a baby picture there, or by naturalization. Uh, naturalization is governed by 8 U.S.C. 1427. Those of you who are immigration lawyers in the room, you're quite familiar with this. Tonight's talk is not about naturalization. Instead, we'll be talking about birthright citizenship. There is a natural correlation between the two in that citizenship overall, once one becomes a U.S. citizen, then that, uh, that citizenship comes with uh, a host of different rights and privileges. Right? But tonight's talk is focusing on how one acquires citizenship by birth. And so uh, the first, historically, is through the common law. There are primarily two ways, um, two methods of acquiring citizenship as recognized by the common law. One is through what's called Yusengwinis, right of the blood. And that means that if your parents are US citizens, then you also, the child, 
becomes a U.S. citizen. And the other way is right of the soil. And that literally means if you're born on a U.S. land, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but technically if you're born in the U.S., the United States, one of the 50 states, or the District of Columbia, or U.S. territory, you acquire U.S. citizenship, right? So under the common law. Um, it's important for us to recognize that the common law was not always applied equally. In fact, as applied to African Americans, um, the Supreme Court said in Dred Scott versus Stanford that they were not U.S. citizens at all at birth, despite the fact that it has long been held under the common law that if you're born on the, um, on, in the soil, right, U.S. soil, one acquires U.S. citizenship. So in Dred Scott, the Supreme Court said that Dred Scott was not a citizen. As a result, he could not go to federal court and sue for his freedom. There was no diversity of jurisdiction. Um, and so then, a few years later, Congress, the United States adopted the, uh, the 14th Amendment, which included Section 1, Clause 1, of, uh, which says that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. All right, so now we've got uh, the 14th Amendment that essentially codified the common law of use solely. In 1898, the Supreme Court was faced with a question of how to interpret the 14th Amendment. And specifically, the question was whether a Chinese man, Wang Kim Ar, who was born in California and whose parents were Chinese immigrants, residents of San Francisco, but they were not U.S. citizens, right? They were also not diplomats, and there's an important point to be made there. So the question was whether Wang Kim Ar was a citizen of the United States because he was born in, um, in California. Mr. Wang Kim Ar actually left the United States twice. First, when he was 17 years old, he went back to China. He went to China to visit his parents, who had returned to China after having been a resident, residents of the United States for about 20 years. He goes to China um, when he was 17 to visit his parents. He comes back. He's allowed in. Next time, a few years later, he goes back to China to visit them again, and then he returns in a year. This time, he was excluded from the border. Recall the time, this was around 1890s. During this time, there was a Chinese exclusion um, case, or the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese were banned from, it was the first race-based ban um, that was passed by Congress. And so Chinese were not allowed to enter the United States. And so immigration officers said, wait, you're Chinese. You're not allowed to enter here. But Wang Kim Ar argued that he's a US citizen based on his birth on, in California. And so he challenged his exclusion. The case goes all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And the court said that, yes, under the 14th Amendment, Mr. Ark is a US citizen at birth by virtue of the citizenship clause. OK. It's also important, though, to, um, to, to highlight that there are exceptions to the 14th Amendment. A critical exception here is what says, not subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Here it says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. So who is not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States? Well, among those are, par are children whose parents are diplomats. Why, why might that be the case? That if you're a child um, of diplomats, then you are considered to be not subject to the jurisdiction thereof, even though you were born on US soil. What could be the argument that you're not subject to the jurisdiction thereof? Yes, Mr. Guerrero. Um, perhaps because of the diplomatic community sometimes afforded to diplomats, um, particularly with the, the specific plot of soil? That's right, right? A diplomat means that they're not subject to the United States. And as a result, then if you're, ch if you're a diplomat and your child is born, in New York, that child does not acquire birthright citizenship, right? Um, a second exception here under the not subject to the jurisdiction thereof are people, are members 
of federally recognized tribes. If one is born in a tribe that is federally recognized, that person is not a U.S. citizen under the 14th Amendment. And then the other exception here, and this is what we'll talk about this a little bit more later, if you're not born in the United States, then you do not acquire birthright citizenship under the citizenship clause. There are statutes that allow one to, uh, to, um, uh, to be recognized as a citizen, but not under the citizenship clause. Okay, so we talked about the common law, and there were two that I mentioned, you said witness, and you still leave. The 14th Amendment subsequently codified that um, into the U.S. Constitution. And then remember the exceptions. As I mentioned, there are statutes. And here I'll introduce us to some of the statutes that apply to the U.S. territories. Okay, so next question. Those of you who are, who are born here in the, um, in the CNMI, raise your hand if you were born in the CNMI. And I'll say, um, I won't give a date. Some of you are probably born before 1986. Some of you are born after, right? The point is just whether you're born here. Are you a U.S. citizen under the citizenship clause? Yes. You're not. Why? Uh, because it would be uh, when we became a territory in 1978 when we signed the covenant that gave us citizenship. Yes. And okay. it became effective when? Who can tell me the magic year when you you became U.S. citizens? Yeah, don't we celebrate it here? Yes, Covenant Day or something. Citizenship Day. Citizenship Day. Yeah. Nineteen eighty-six. Good. Okay. Great, Miss Gal. Okay. So, birthright citizenship in the U.S. territories. Here's the list of all the various U.S. Uh, territories that yeah. acquired after the 1898 Spanish-American War were the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And then after that, American Samoa acquired or became part of the United States, depending on who uh, you're talking to. Um, the American Samoa became part of the United States in 1900, and then the Virgin Islands in 1917, the Sinai in 1975. When did U.S. citizenship get extended to these territories? The Philippines was never extended, and we'll talk about why uh, that's the case. Um, Puerto Rico, not until 1917. Uh, Guam, 1950, through their Organic Act. Right? American Samoa also never had a law extended granting them U.S. citizenship. And then the Virgin Islands came later. Uh, their citizenship came in 1927, and then the CNMI in 1986. Um, there's a notation here, but we're not going to go into detail about it, but there was a litigation called Sabangan versus Powell that recognized citizenship for some people who were born in the Marianas before 1986. And the dates there are uh, January 9, 1978 to November 4, 1986. They, were considered, they are considered to be U.S. citizens even though they were born before 1986 and their parents were not TTPI uh, residents. Right, so I'm happy to talk about that some more during the Q&A. It's not germane specifically to the, uh, the issue for tonight. But here are the statutes that provide citizenship for people in the U.S. territories. Right? So if one is born in a U.S. territory, then the uh, citizenship is grounded not, on the citizen, not in the citizenship clause, but by statute. So I'll pause here. It doesn't matter from your perspective. Um, that citizenship is not based in the U.S. Constitution, but rather based in statutes. What difference does it make if one is a U.S. citizen no matter what? Right? At first, through, through, whether it's through the 14th Amendment or through con uh, congressional statutes. They take it away. Yes. Okay. So in theory, right, what Congress giveth, Congress can take away. By, con uh, by uh, contrast, the U.S. Constitution if a right is granted through the U.S. Constitution, it's either through the interpretation by the Supreme Court, right, or by congressional amendment. And so, theoretically, um, it hasn't happened in a long time. The citizenship can be taken away by well, it hasn't happened that uh, Congress has given citizenship and then taken it, taken it away. That's uh, Mr. Baba. That's the that's the argument. Okay, so. 
you saw here that um, before citizenship was acquired, people in the U.S. territories had U.S. nationality. Right? The question then is, what is a U.S. national, or what does it mean to be a U.S. national and not a U.S. citizen? Um, as you can see in this chart, Filipinos and American Samoans um, are, are the only ones that didn't ultimately have citizenship extended to them by Congress. Okay, so there are two key Supreme Court cases that provided some definition of what U.S. nationality means. First is the Gonzalez versus Williams case. And here, really, the question was whether the question was whether this Puerto Rican woman who was entering the United in New York, whether she can be excluded from the border. And um, ultimately, the court said no, cannot be excluded, but she's not necessarily uh, because she's not an alien, not a, uh, an alien with quotes, right? So she's not a non-citizen, but the court didn't say whether she is a U.S. citizen. So let that open. That was in 1904. Then in 1925, there was a, a, a case that involved um, a, a citizens of the Philippines, and there the Supreme Court said that Filipinos, who were then at the time, the Philippines was part of the United States as a U.S. territory, they were neither citizens nor non-citizens. That's what U.S. nationality meant. Right, it's in this in-between state. Um, it's an interstitial citizenship. That's what I call it. In between uh, the space between citizen and non-citizen. That's uh, what uh, U.S. nationals fall within those interstices. <laughs> it's actually recognized by statute under 8 U.S.C. 1408. A person born in an outlying possession of the United States, on or after the date of formal acquisition of such possession is a national but not a citizen of the United States. So unless Congress passes a separate statute extending citizenship, then if one is born in any of these U.S. possessions, that person acquires U.S. nationality. What does that mean then? Um, it's important to understand that these, uh, a lot of the, the cases that dealt with U.S. nationality are a part of the American empire. This is a political cartoon that was uh, created during this, this era, the early 1900s. Notice how um, Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba were all um, viewed as wards of, um, of Uncle Sam, uh, students of Uncle Sam. This obviously was a critique of the American empire in the 1900s. Um, I use it here just to highlight some of the connections among the other territories that were acquired. Either those uh, Hawaii, which was a territory that ultimately became a, um, a state, and also Cuba, right, a place that, in which we have uh, the United States has strong military interests. And notice too how chi a, 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 a representation of a Chinese immigrant is at the door, which means that uh, she was uh, he was not being allowed in. And then an American Indian, uh, a member of an American Indian tribe, is at the back. Um, with, with a reading upside down. And so again, this is just a part of a framing of what was going on during this time during the American empire. And that was influencing how the US Supreme Court and other courts were addressing questions of constitutional law in the US territories. Okay, so how, what, what difference does it make that someone is a US citizen and um, that someone's a US national? Well, here's a chart to give us some brief explanation. Right, as both U.S. citizens and U.S. nationals have the right to enter and remain in the United States, they can never be deported. So if an American Samoa moves to the United States um, and, and commits a crime, let's just say, that person cannot be deported because American Samoa is part of the United States. Right, when the, the, when the Philippines was a U.S. territory, same thing. Filipinos could not be uh, deported to the Philippines because, same idea, the Philippines was, uh, were part of the United States. Um, right to vote is one that, and then there are these different rights of citizenship, right to vote, right to serve on the jury, right to petition family members to immigrate to the United States, right to work um, or apply for federal jobs. Those are limited to U.S. citizens, with some exceptions if it's allowed by a particular employer, for example, 
then um, that person could apply for federal employment. Those are rare. Um, so U.S. nationals are prohibited from voting, from participating on the jury, petitioning family members, um, applying for certain federal jobs, including law enforcement jobs. Right? And so, yes? But petitioning family members, they can. They can as U.S. nationals? Yes, I've just done that. Okay, so Mr. Mailman, thank you. That's, uh, that's helpful for us to, to think about, but one of the current lawsuits right now, that's um, they, in, in, by American Samoans, they've argued that USCIS does not recognize their ability to petition. Was petition. Okay, and it's been approved? Oh yeah. That's great. I mean, I think that might be the first that I'm, that's certainly the first that I'm hearing. Because, uh, about this because the the case, the live case right now, among the issues that they've raised is they're unable to petition for the family members because they are not U.S. citizens, right? U.S. citizenship comes with a, a, a host of rights and privileges, including the ability to vote and ability to for um, to petition family members for family unification. Yes, Chief Judge. Here's the Who's this client? Well, the American Samoan was naturalized, because I've naturalized American Samoan. So. Naturalized after they were approved. Oh, oh. yeah. And, and I looked up laws currently that America, U.S. nationals can sponsor family members with green cards if the family members otherwise qualify. Hmm. They don't get what they don't get. Sorry for interrupting. Is that if you're a U.S. citizen and you have a family member who has, for example, a U.S. state is out of status, but the application is otherwise successful, it's forgiven. It's not the same case for the immediate relative national. They're treated exactly as if they're green card Oh, interesting. I'm going to have to look uh, look that up because that and. And that I think that the current litigants in the Samoan case would really be interested in, to hear about this case that you just successfully filed. Because for the most part, the ability to petition family members is resides in the right of citizenship, not in the right of US nationality. And so why is that the case? Why is it that there are differences between rights um, for US nationals versus rights for US citizens? Um, here is a good segue for us to talk about the insular cases. Right. There are a host of insular cases. Some scholars say that it's only the cases in the 19, early 1900s, 1901. Others just expanded to 1922. And even others ex have expanded the scope of the insular cases to beyond 1922. Um, for, for lawyers here, I just thought I'd, I'd highlight for you some of these um, the citations for the insular cases. Uh, the key Supreme Court case is Downs versus Bidwell. And here, um, I, I highlighted some, uh, included some quotes for you from the case itself that shows why the insular cases back then and, and, and now are quite problematic right, from a race-based perspective. Here I'll read, some, um, I'll read just parts of the, the quote. According to the, uh, the Supreme Court, those possessions are, uh, referring to the U.S. territories, those possessions are inhabited by alien races differing from us in religion, customs, laws, methods of taxation and modes of thought, the administration of government and justice according to Anglo-Saxon principles may for a time be impossible. The court continues, we are therefore of the opinion that the island of Puerto Rico is a territory appurtenant and belonging to the United States, but not part of the United States. And so here's the key um, phrasing of Puerto Rico and other US territories as foreign but in a domestic sense, right? So they're domestic in that they are part of the United States, but they're foreign because they are different racially, culturally, and, and ways of life. And, um, and as a result of those differences, the court decides to not extend all constitutional rights to Puerto Rico and all the other US territories. Here in Downs versus Bidwell, the court further talks about how citizens of the United States, um, 
discover this unknown land, people with uncivilized race, yet rich in soil, and valuable to the United States for commercial <coughs> and future reasons, right? And the court continues that the people um, in Puerto Rico were inhabited by people who were utterly unfit for American <laughs> citizenship. Are there any typos in these things that you <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm afraid not, sir. Um, these are, and this is only one, there are other, these other cases here are filled with other quotes that talk about, that describe the people of the territories of, at the time, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Hawaii, and, um, and, and those are the three main um, places that were uh, addressed in these cases. Okay, here's another one later in time, 1922. And in this case, by this time, by 1922, the Supreme Court had already established the proposition that because people in the territories are different, then the Constitution does not follow the flag. Right? By this time, by, the by 1922, the court has said that it's well established that the entire Constitution applies to the United States territory of its own force only if that territory is incorporated. Incorporated essentially means, as the Supreme Court explained, um, is that if they are on their way to becoming states, so subject to statehood, right? That means that the other territories that we're talking about by this time, the 1920s, including Puerto Rico, the biggest, well, the Philippines was the biggest at this time, they were not subject. Puerto Rico and the Philippines were not subject, were not on their way to becoming states, and so they were unincorporated. Because they are unincorporated, then only fundamental rights would apply in the territory. Okay, I'm going to pause here. Are there any questions so far about the framing of the U of the insular cases? Why the courts applied used um, the insular cases and how they apply in the territories? Okay, all right. So now I want to bring us back to the question of citizenship. Right. Recall that I said um, I, I highlight the Wang Kim Art case that the 14, under the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court said that if you're born in the United States, subject to the jurisdiction thereof, you're a U.S. citizen, right? So then the question becomes, well, what about being born in a U.S. territory? Why is it that it had to be done by statute? In the case of Rabban versus INS, um, in the a case decided by the Ninth Circuit in 1994, the Supreme Court addressed that, uh, the Ninth Circuit addressed that question and said that relying on the insular cases, the term United States, as used in the Constitution, is limited only to the states of the Union. And so, as a result of that, the court, in the, in the Ninth Circuit said that it would not be correct to extend citizenship to persons living in the United States territories simply because they were subject to the jurisdiction thereof. So, in other words, the Philippines, during this time when Mr. Rabban was born, um, he was born a U.S. national, um, the Philippines, as a country, was subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. But because it was not part of, uh, the, it was not part of the United States, these are the, because of the insular cases, the court said that birth in the U.S. territory did not lead to U.S. citizenship. Yes, Mr. Guerrero. Uh, does that mean that the court implicitly imp uh, implied that citizenship is not a fundamental right contained in the Constitution? Because in your previous slide, you said uh, only fundamental constitutional rights apply in the territory. So by principle, <coughs> citizenship is not fundamental? Yeah, not yet. No. So instead of, the th in instead of engaging in the question of whether citizenship is a fundamental right and so therefore would apply, instead, the court in the Rabban case only focused on the subject to the jurisdiction thereof mm -hmm. component of the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. and said that it does not apply, right? Subsequent cases did examine whether um, citizenship um, is part, is fundamental such that it ought to be applicable, mm -hmm. but that's not this case. And we'll get there in a few slides. Uh, Rabban was not the only case. There are many other cases. Um, here are, uh, and here's a list of them. 
Okay, so the Ninth Circuit, the Second, the Third, and then there's another Ninth Circuit there. Um, and then also the D.C. Circuit, oh, the D District Court, the number one up to the D.C. Circuit. Um, and um, as I'll talk about soon, the Tenth Circuit um, also addressed the question, but it's a, not involving Filipinos, but instead American Samoans, right? But at this time, we understand that at least with respect to Filipinos who were born in the Philippines and were U.S. nationals, um, they did not apply your U.S. citizenship under the citizenship clause. Right? It was, um, if any kind of claim to citizenship, if, if for them to be successful, it had to be based on the statute extending citizenship to them, unless they're able to naturalize through some other means. Okay, so now we fast forward to um, American Samoans and U.S. nationality. Um, today, American Samoans are the only U.S. nationals. Um, they have a U.S. passport, but when you open it up, it says, that the bearer is a United States national and not a United States citizen. So how might uh, U.S. Um, how might American Samoans acquire U.S. citizenship? Yes. Naturalization. Okay, right. So they can naturalize. Can they naturalize an American Samoan? They have to. Leave. They have to move from American Samoa. They need to move to one of the 50 states and then apply for naturalization. Naturalization costs, um, actually, Mr. Mailman, tell me, what is the fee for naturalization these days? Uh, $725 for biometrics. Okay, all right, so over seven. Yeah, that's not the attorney's fee. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <laughs> well, both of us, right? <laughs> all right, uh, we, we, there are naturalization fees, there's a cost of moving, right, um, to another, to one of the states looking for a job there in order to support yourself um, and your family, um, leaving family behind in your in American Samoa if you want to. Those are some of the things that one has to do in order to apply for, um, to become a citizen if you are from American Samoa and you want U.S. citizenship. Mr. Rose? Yes. Uh, but yes, Chief Judge. You mentioned that um, going to a state, but we naturalize them here. Is it because they don't have a district court in American Samoa? That's right. Yeah, so under this, they had to, I think that's probably, that makes sense. There, there's no place, but I mean, they can go to go to USCIS and apply, but they would have to go outside. outside. Yes. And this is a, a, such a cost to them also from a military perspective. One of the arguments that have been made by some American Samoans is that there many people from American Samoa um, joined the military. And somehow they don't have the benefit of citizenship, right? They have to, um, they're U.S. nationals. And remember the chart, if you're a U.S. national, you can't vote, can't serve on a jury, can't apply for certain jobs. For those who are, who are going to college, it means that they can't apply for some federal loans or they can't qualify for Pell Grants, for example, because those are limited to U.S. citizens. Professor, yes. um, you mentioned the military. Can American Samoans become officers of the military? Oh, sir, I don't know, actually. Does an officer have to be a U.S. citizen? Then, I mean, if I, I'm not, so I, it's not my area, and I, I'm not going to say no, I'm just saying. Because quite a number of them in their services. So if the requirement is U.S. citizenship, then they would have to, for anything, whether it's for a job, law enforcement job, or the military, then one would need to satisfy that requirement, right, and apply for citizenship. I don't know if this still holds across the board, but the dividing line between who could hold what job had to do with the determination that the job was or was not a <coughs> policy making this job or a policy making job. And, so, and so that might go to the exceptions, and right? Sometimes they were very strange uh, determinations. Uh, many years ago, I was a driver's license. In California, one of the people in my cohort coming in was a stateless guy who was told that only that year, due to a court case, could he have this policy with his job. I suppose, I mean, um, if one is, if the policy requires citizenship for because of decisions that have to be made, I can understand the reasoning behind that versus. 
some uh, requirement that or a job that doesn't have the responsibility of policy making. Okay, so here I'm uh, bringing us back to the American Samoans and U.S. nationality. Um, the most recent case to challenge the, um, the the lack of citizenship for American Samoans is the Pitisamanu versus United States case. This was filed in Utah. There were three Utah residents who were born in American Samoa and had lived in, um, became residents of Utah. And they wanted recognition to um, as citizens by virtue of the citizenship clause instead of having to apply for citizenship by through naturalization. And here the district court relied on Wong Kim Ark case <coughs> and said that yes, the citizenship clause applies to um, in, in American Samoa and therefore these residents were, uh, were citizens under the 14th Amendment of the Citizenship Clause. That was a victory, right? Prior to this case, there was another one, the Tuwa Wa case, um, that led to, uh, that it resulted in both the District Court and the D.C. Circuit disagreeing with individuals who claim that they are U.S. citizens. So th this District Court was the first time that there was recognition at all, in any of the, any time, in, in, in all the cases in which a citizenship claim was based on birth in the U.S. territory, um, under the citizenship clause, this was the very first one. I do want to point out that uh, the American Samoan government and the time Congresswoman Amada, they moved to intervene in the case. Here, um, this is a consistent um, position that the government of American Samoa has taken even before in the first case, in the Tuawa case. And in this, um, in, even to this day, the American Samoa government have intervened and have argued that citizenship should not be extended by the court. Instead, they've said if citizenship is to be extended to the United States, it should be done by Congress, not by what they call judicial fiat. Um, if you read the case of the citations there, there are also other um, arguments as to why citizenship should not be applicable in American Samoa. And again, this is the perspective of the American Samoan government. They're saying that because of the American Samoan way of life, the uh, uh, life of American Samoa, they are concerned about citizenship. Uh, what if that if they were to become U.S. citizens, then they might lose some of their cultural traditions in um, both in land ownership, but also in uh, the different types of titles that they give to their chiefs, the Matai system. And the, so underlying their concerns here, uh, the American Samoa government is, they want the ability to have, uh, to negotiate with the United States what citizenship would mean for them. Instead of going to a district court, um, and then a, ten, a, ten, or a circuit level, and then the US Supreme Court, um, having to decide for them whether they should be considered U.S. citizens under the U.S. Constitution. So this is also another good way, uh, good time to pause and ask whether uh, there are people here who know, of course, the history of how the CMI came to be. What are your thoughts about um, the argument that citizenship should not be done through uh, the U.S. Constitution, but instead through congressional statute? through some kind of an agreement. Does that, uh, does that make sense? Even if you disagree with it, does it make sense to you that that would be the point that they're making, that there should be some kind of a political negotiation with Congress? The covenant is an act of Congress, right? Yeah. So that's the founding document for the scene of mind. So that document exists as evidence of that. And in the covenant, as you know, I'll, I'll kind of um, uh, fast forward a little bit. The covenants included um, the discussions about land alienation restrictions, right? That later became part of the CNMI Constitution. And so um, that there was a case that challenged what's Article 12, and then we'll, we'll uh, tie that with, with what's going on here. But yes, um, ultimately, for some, uh, those in American Samoa, for them, citizenship should be decided by the people instead of by, um, through political negotiation, instead of having to go to a lot, going through a case and having a court make that decision for them. Uh, now, Professor, 
I would disagree a little bit with the statement that uh, the covenant is an act of Congress. It's a negotiated agreement approved by Congress. I think the distinction is quite important. That's my first point. Uh, my second point uh, is that the covenant itself included the option to select nas being a national rather than a citizen if the individual wished. I believe that not a single person in the Northern Marianas chose to be a national rather than a citizen, so everyone became citizens. But that option was included as part of that. So I think it's limited applicability to the unique situation of the American Samoa where, where they see a cultural, potential cultural conflict with citizenship. I don't think anyone in the same life ever perceived anything like that. As in the connection between citizenship itself, formal citizenship, and and cultural traditions. Right. We had Article 12, which actually was actually created and initially by the U.S. side of the negotiations, but then became considered to be an important part of those unique provisions of the government that uh, have been protected, so to speak, by the insular cases when they were challenged uh, in court. And, some things weren't protected. And, and we'll talk about the uh, Wobble case and the insular cases. But as to your point, I'm not going to quibble in a room full of experts on the covenant and whether it was congressional or not. But in 1980, it, when the covenant became um, effective in 1975, there was an act of Congress. It had to be approved by Congress. It had to be signed by the president. right? But yes, I think the point here is well taken. There was a political agreement. Uh, there was negotiations for the different provisions of the covenant we have in the archives here, all the section by section analysis of the covenant, and as well as the, his, the legislative history of uh, the covenant and what, what the people here have negotiated with the United States. Um, here, so uh, we know that at the district court level, American Samoan, the American Samoan government intervened, they were allowed to intervene, and then the, tenth, the case goes up to the Tenth Circuit, and here the Tenth Circuit recognizes that there are two um, lines of precedent. Either the Wong Kim Art case, 14th Amendment, Citizenship Clause applies, or the Insular Cases, right? And here, the court recognizes that the Insular Cases are indeed controversial. They've been criticized for um, amounting to a license for further imperial expansion and being based in a racist ideology. We, there were no um, mistakes earlier, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's quite clear just by reading the text of the, the cases. The court also recognizes that the purpose of the insular cases to us today, the reasoning is now questionable. Uh, there are concerns um, about uh, native inhabitants of the unincorporated territories that were simply unfit for American constitutional regime. And those are problematic uh, today for us. Problematic then, certainly problematic for us today to hear and to read. Right, so the court recognizes the problems of the insular cases. Yet, the court also emphasized that the Supreme Court continues to use the insular cases as a framework for deciding constitutional applicability. And as a rule of law, we must follow what the US Supreme Court has said. Right? And so as a result, the Tenth Circuit said, notwithstanding its beginnings, uh, the insular cases provide a flexible framework. And the court says it has been repurposed uh, to preserve the dignity and autonomy of the people of America's overseas territories. So here's the repurposing of the insular cases um, that is coming into play, not only in this Pichisamano case, but also in the Tulalwa case that I mentioned earlier. There have also been new legal scholarship talking about the revitalization, repurposing, the rehabilitation of the insular cases um, to think about, to cast aside their racist ideology and instead think about how they might be used to preserve autonomy and self-determination. And guess which cases are being used primarily to make that case, to make those claims? It's the cases in the CNMI, um, in particular Wobble, is one of the cases that many of these law review articles have cited as the basis for repurposing uh, the insular cases because of the way that the insular cases have been used to uphold Article 12. So more on that in a minute. Um, 
Lastly, the court says that there are grave misgivings. The court had grave misgivings about imposing citizenship on the American people, particularly when they said in court that they don't want it, right? The people said they don't want it, even though these individual American Samoans in the states have said we want to be recognized as citizens. So then one question becomes, we know that American Samoan government have said we don't want citizenship. How have the other territories responded? Um, there was a, a amicus briefs filed by uh, Guam and Amai, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and they've all argued, along with the ACLU and many other um, um, scholars and activists, to say that the insular cases should be overruled. Right? Um, and with respect to the citizen, uh, citizenship issue, um, they've pointed out that U.S. citizenship is compatible with the preservation of each territory's distinctive cultural heritage. Right? So there's no disconnect at all between citizenship and culture, according to this amicus brief. And then full disclosure, I have submitted, um, I have joined amicus briefs for uh, di uh, uh, different law professors, constitutional law um, professors. I've signed on to those briefs. Um, I was also part of a, a brief from legal historians arguing for the overruling of the insular cases. But I've also always said with a caveat, and this is what I testified before Congress last year, that one thing that we need to acknowledge is how the insular cases, as racist as they are, have led to the preservation of Article 12 in the CNMI. And there ought to be a discussion about that. That should be included, in my view, as part of the analysis as to whether to overrule our, um, the insular cases. Okay, so I've been speaking for 47 minutes now, and I'd like to make sure that we have some time. I'd like to end here by talking about post-insular cases, America, implications for the CNMI. Uh, who are the, uh, the entities in some of those jurisdictions who uh, you know, the CMI and more? Oh, these are um, the, I have to look back before for the, the individuals. No, these are con con congressmen, uh, the, the, the oh. representatives of uh, these territories. But it wasn't only them, there were also other individuals who filed um, amicus briefs. Um, in support of overruling. I think it was the Attorney General. The, well, there's this, this is a separate one, too. I mean, there are a number of different, um, many amicus briefs filed and in support of the individual American South. Uh, in the case of this particular amicus brief for the CNMI, it was uh, Representative Sheila Babata in the CNMI House. Okay. Thank you. Professor, where is the best place to find this? What you just stated that you should have pieces of Somehow supporting or part of the world. Where, where can we go there? You can go to, I, I can send you, you, I can send you the link to this website, Quality Now, that lists a lot of uh, many different briefs and legal scholarships that talk about that talk about that point, but also counter arguments. Right? There are um, just to present both sides of the issues, that particular website, and, and there will be links to other websites too. Where you can find the, um, that uh, those articles. Well, maybe just email it to the bar, and maybe our, our executive director can share. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so post insular cases, American implications for the CNMI. Um, Article 12, um, I'm going to go through some of these slides quickly because we're familiar with them. Article 12 limits land ownership or possession of, uh, long, of land. Um, it, to persons of Northern Marianas descent. I know I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over technicalities here. Um, I wanted to point out that um, an NMD um, is, refers to people as citizen or national of the United States who originally at least one quarter Northern Marianas Chamorro, Northern Marianas Carolinian blood or a combination thereof, or if a person is adopted, right, by um, before the age of 18. And then the purpose of, deter for purposes of determining NMD, a person will be full, shall be full-blooded at uh, Northern Marianas tomorrow or Carolinian if that person was born or domiciled in the NMI by 1950 and was a citizen of the TTPI before the termination of the trusteeship agreement. It was subsequently amended so that uh, any person 
who has uh, some degree of Northern Marianas Chamorro or Carolinian blood or combination thereof, um, if they have some degree of Northern Marianas Chamorro, Northern Marianas Carolinian blood, then they are persons of MMD. Okay, so um, Wobble versus Viola Cruces, we, I assigned this case to my students. We, talk, we had two days talking about it. Um, it was a challenge to Article 12, as many in the room are aware. And here the Ninth Circuit used the insular cases the court says that um, inter, um, interposing constitutional provision of equal protection law would both be impractical and anomalous in the setting. Absent the alienation restriction, the political union would not have been possible. It also would have hampered United States interests and ability to form political alliances. And for the NMI people, the equalization of access would be a hollow victory if, led, if it led to the loss of their land, their cultural and social identity, and the benefits of United States sovereignty. So these are the specific reasons why, according to the Ninth Circuit, applying to insular cases, Article 12 should be upheld. Right? And it continues to, so the challenge did not, um, that was unsuccessful, Article 12 remains constitutional. Um, so then, if the uh, insular cases are to be overruled, the question becomes, will Article 12 survive equal protection challenge? Right? We'd have to, courts would have to, the court would have to be, uh, would have to analyze the 14th Amendment's equal protection clause, which says that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And a court would have to look into um, looking at different levels of scrutiny depending on whether Article 12 uh, NMD is considered to be, if it's not a racial category, then the application, then the proper level of review will be rational basis. If it's a racial category, then the uh, level to be used of scrutiny would be strict scrutiny, right? Which is the strict, strict scrutiny is applied to any kinds of um, uh, discrimination or distinctions on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And so here we've got um, um, a two, a, a two different ways of thinking about it and how a court might look at a challenge, any future challenge to Article 12, assuming the insular cases are overruled, which we, we don't know if that's ever going, going to happen. But theoretically, um, if, it's, if, our, if NMD is considered to be a racial category, then strict scrutiny, as I said, will be the level of, of review. And in that case, Rice versus Cayetano will be the operating, um, will be the framework. Uh, Rice versus Cayetano and the Davis case are unique, though, in that those are 15th Amendment cases, right? So, arguably, those are just different, and that that makes sense that it would be uh, the 15th Amendment is uh, it is an important amendment that has a long history of jurisprudence. If NMD, that category, is a political category, then Morton Moncari applies, which means that it, uh, a court would use rational basis and uh, most likely would be upheld because of um, the importance of recognizing that there are certain political categories that are acknowledged as belong within equal protection groups. All right. So, I will end there, but I'd like to highlight some, if you're interested in reading more of your articles that are quite lengthy, and here I want to acknowledge some of my former research assistants who helped me in, in some of these writings, like Jose Matnas and um, Jen Smith. Um, they helped to um, help me with some of this research that I did. Um, and these are four law review articles I wrote, not only looking at Article 12, but also just in general the insular cases. I'm happy to send you um, links to them if you're interested in reading some more. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up for any additional questions or comments about any of the slides that I've presented. Um, well, what's interesting is that Justice Gorsuch in a recent Puerto Rico case, um, he said that it's time to overrule the insert cases. And there's a strong movement to overrule the insert cases. I don't think it'll be granted, though. Um, I, I would be surprised if, if the court ends up hearing it. Um, but 
if it does, and the, and the insular cases are overruled, I think that it's about time, right? There's no reason why the insular cases should continue to this day. I also don't think it's the end of Article 12. I think there are strong reasons historically, um, culturally, to support Article 12 under, even under the equal protection framework of uh, race or political category. I'm more of a political category camp. Um, I think one can make a strong case that uh, at least the original uh, covenant that it was a political that it was a political category. Um, I, 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 as I said to my students today, here um, if race if MMD is considered to be a racial category, it'll be really difficult, in my personal opinion, for that to be uh, for it to survive given the history. Given the, the long line of cases that a court must follow, um, but political category might be one way to uphold Article 12, and um, but it remains to be seen. It depends really on the whether the uh, insular cases will be overruled. Professor, can you come across the case of the new racist DPI? No, I'm not familiar with that case. I I recommend. Okay, what was the case about? Uh, it's about pay, pay, pay. Uh, the state side for getting more money than the other reasons. It was just mm -hmm. people are coming to be closer to home. Okay. We want the people yeah, to I'd love to get the citation so I can look it up. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I came from uh, the Baikon area, 1978, when we voted. The education there was, we understand we're a minority, that's from the Caribbean, uh, the followers side. But we understand we be, we are minorities, and when we join the union with the United States, we're gonna not count it. We are not, we're not. So, I think that big sell from the political side was, we're gonna try to put in something to protect the silence. And that was the article 12 that came about, that negotiation. Because Mr. Moore and the Kelly understood that if we have a union with the United States, or just numbers. And I think the, the Wobble case um, uh, said that, said that the, the covenant would not have been, would not have continued. It, it wouldn't have happened. The Commonwealth would not have happened if um, the, if our Article 12 or land alienation restriction uh, was not included. So although that uh, that language was part of the insular cases, I think it can still be used within a straight up equal protection analysis. No one seemed to be talking about the makeup of the CNMI Senate and how this would affect that as well. That seems pretty foundational to me. If, if, if these laws, or if these cases are decided in that manner, that that seems to uh, really attack the case. Exactly. That, that was one of my cases. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was the name of the, what was the uh, case citation? Yeah. Or the, the, well, the title? It was. It was Ray Van B. but in, in the Supreme Court, it was uh, Oris versus. Ray Van B. Sublime. Okay. Yeah, but Oris versus Sublime. Yeah, Ray Van B. Sublime. Yeah. It was a direct appeal yeah. from the U.S. Supreme Court. Right, because it's, it's about it's legislature, the makeup of the legislature. Yeah. He's got a three judge family. I had to say it was you know, from my perspective, when I do these talks, I normally don't hear from the lawyers or the, <laughs> I, or other litigants involved. So it's it's really um, it's such an, an honor to be up here to be able to talk about them. Yes. Hi, uh, Professor. I'm, I'm intrigued with the U.S. national space, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the so the amicus brief you just passed that. But they argue that U.S. citizenship is consistent with preserving sort of the cultural heritage mm -hmm. in these jurisdictions, but it seems to be the opposite for American Samoa. It seems that that's the argument that U.S. citizenship would be um, distributed among the people in American Samoa, but it's somehow connected with the cultural heritage. What would you argue? It's their beliefs. It's, it's, the, it's how they... Um, they, they've had a political, um, a 
it's a commission to, to talk about it in American Samoa, and there's just this fear that citizenship will help will, will lead to the undoing of some of the protections for their cultural traditions, including land ownership, but also the chief system, the nobilities, titles of nobility, which are not allowed in the U.S. Constitution. And so um, in informal conversations that I've been a part of, um, the CNMI examples often um, given to say they're U.S. citizens and they get to keep their land ownership restriction. Citizenship is not the thing that you're, you ought not be worried about it. Um, but again, informal conversations. Uh, from a formal, uh, at least formally, in the briefs that were filed for the course, they said that there, there's just this, it's what they, they want to be able to be at the table and have some discussions about what citizenship means for them. Mr. White. Why don't they? I asked the same question as Neil Weir. Yeah. And you couldn't give me an answer. Why don't the Samoans say, we need to negotiate a covenant right now? They can. I mean, Neil and I have talked about this too. Um, I think uh, one of the things that Neil and, and um, Equality Now, they're hoping to be able to do is go to American Samoa and encourage them to ask for a negotiation, right? They're unincorporated, and so they can. They have yet to have that kind of, to, to have a seat at the table. I'm not sure there's such desire. No? Right now. Yes. Uh, I keep seeing the word territory there. Is the CNMI considered a territory, a U.S. territory? From a legal perspective, it is, but there are different gradations of territories. And the, the CNMI has the covenant that frames the, uh, the rights and obligations and privileges of what it means to be, uh, how, why it's distinguishable from, let's say, Puerto Rico or from Guam. But from a technical perspective, they are, and there are five U.S. territories, and what that means is Congress <laughs> can do what it wants. Congress has the power under the U.S. Constitution to extend rights, to deny rights, right? But the CNMI has the covenant that governs the various responsibilities and uh, what the relationship looks like. Yes, and we have that covenant, right? We also have, um, I, isn't it? Um, like, uh, what do you, I don't know, I don't want to say supreme, so you guys might attack me, but, uh, <laughs> I don't want to attack you. <laughs> it's, um, because it was negotiated within that covenant about our, we make our own laws. But isn't that uh, considered as supreme than the U.S. territory? I'm going to give the classic <laughs> law professor an answer, and that's, it depends. It depends on what issue we're talking about. If we're talking about a fun, a, um, a certain rights that are statute, I mean, they're, they're, we have a system of federalism. The United States still trumps states and U.S. territories, but there are certain rights that reside in the states, certain rights that, rights that reside in the CNMI by virtue of the covenant. So it depends. Depends on what we're talking about. Okay. I'm seeing more hands, and I don't remember what time. I, it, some people haven't had lunch yet, I mean, dinner yet. And, okay, so I'm going to call it. I saw new hands. Um, have it Mr. Bautista and then Mr. Marcus. Thank you, Bill Thor. Um, I don't want to belabor this issue um, too much because I know that we kind of talked about this a couple years ago in the past. Um, but then um, the applicability of the Second Amendment here in the Commonwealth. Um, I, I know that, um, I, like, what we talked about was the applicability of the Constitution of the whole as a whole as a territory. But then, um, could you could you maybe shed some light on um, where that argument lies with the applicability of the Second Amendment, given the lack of gun right ownership or sort of, a, I don't want to go against a controversial um, space, but then more of a, we don't have a history of gun violence here in, in, in the Northern Mariana Islands. Could you maybe shed some light on that? Um, I'm not familiar with uh, the Second Amendment issues in the CNMI. I'm actually also not, uh, it's outside the scope of my expertise. So the way that uh, an off-the-cuff response there, well, first question, has it been challenged? Has anyone challenged it? Yeah, yes. I believe it was the Radish case. I, 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 I stand corrected for all the motors in the But I believe it was the Radish case. Was it, wasn't it just your, your note? 
No, your note was not I think there were actually two mm-hmm. cases, and and was a district court was that uh, the more recent federal uh, Supreme Court Second Amendment jurisdiction is binding on the CMI. I personally would take a totally different position given our activist Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Um, which is the understanding of the Second Amendment at the time that the government uh, was negotiated uh, should govern. But I don't think that argument was made to Judge Mongolia. Uh, Um, Well, how about this? It's just outside of my area of expertise. We'll save that for another day. Let's let's save that for another talk and we'll invite someone who's an expert. We talk about spear guns. (laughs) (laughs) We did have an attempt by certain uh, uh, parties to intervene in that case for purposes of appeal to the Ninth Circuit because the Attorney General's office declined to appeal to the Ninth Circuit. All right. Mr. Mabas. I, I didn't write on the second amendment, but a question, you mentioned political classification for mm-hmm. NMD. I guess in your opinion, what would be the strongest argument in support of political classification rather than um, the, the the history of the covenant, uh, the, the history of how the Commonwealth came to be. I think there's enough legislative history to say that um, people, the people of the CNMI, the NMI uh, negotiated for the terms of their citizenship and that uh, land alienation was an essential component of that agreement. You might, one might say, well, it was the United States that insisted upon it, which they did, but at the same time, the people wanted it also, right? And so regardless of who asked for it first, um, it was, as the records show, it, it was an important part of uh, the negotiation. And so within that within that framing, the Article 12 came about, and um, in the night. It started off with 1950 as a baseline, right? Someone had to be here, born or domiciled in 1950, had to be a TTPI resident, and um, I'm sorry, TTPI citizen. And as a result, one can argue that this is a political category, not a racial category. Um, some, in, in there was a case, uh, there was a Guam case. It's not in one of my articles here, but. I made the claim that it was a, it can be argued to be a political category because there are people who are Chamorros and Carolinians who are not, they were not here in 1950, and they were not TTPI citizens, so they would not be considered to, they would be excluded from Article 12, right? I'm not really sure what it means now that it's been expanded to some degree of Northern, of, of Northern Chamorro uh, Carolinian blood. But at the beginning, the founding, I think there was a strong case to be made for political categorization. Mm-hmm. Um, professor, was there, in one of your slides, you mentioned that the uh, government of American Samoa and Congressman Ahmada intervened in the case. Mm-hmm. Do you know if they oh, were on the same side? And then for, you know, I think, mean, of course, I want, you know, my brothers and sisters in Americans almost have the same protections that we have, but I am worried about, um, you know, uh, the, the, I guess, people people from Saipan or Northern Marianas moving to the oh. states and abroad, um, and then essentially, you know, challenging things that would unravel protections here by courts that are very foreign. I mean. You know, there are a lot of people in Boise, Idaho. So will a judge in Idaho unravel Article 12 or um, you know, whatever else? And um, I, I guess just that idea just that doesn't sit well. No, I, I hear that. And uh, there's a divide that, that seems to be the case with the, this Pirisamanu uh, and um, the earlier case, Tuawa. Um, and that the, the state side American Samoans were the, are the ones arguing for citizenship under the citizenship clause, and then American Samoans in the territory are saying, no, we don't want that, right? So then there is that, uh, there seems to be that divide. Um, what I've heard is that there are people in American Samoa who do want citizenship, 
because they don't want to have to to apply for it. They already swear allegiance to the flag, right? They they join the military. But what I'm hearing you say is that what does it mean that someone can go to one of the 50 states and then um, and then challenge uh, an issue? Uh, there are different facts here, though. Someone would have to be here in order to go before the court here to challenge Article 12. In in the Amer in this case, he couldn't find job a job. He couldn't apply for a certain job. So the harm for him was in Utah, right? And so I it, so the, the facts are, are different. But I hear what you're saying about the fear of someone undoing a cultural practice or tradition, um, and, be, and that being done by someone who has left. I think, Professor, just very quickly, if you look to our brothers and sisters in Palau, the Marcios, the FSM, they still have their traditional government uh, uh, structures in place, albeit they're not citizens, but they act and do things just like any other American citizen, but they still have. The courts, however, have made it very clear. If you are not voted into office by the people, you have no business talking about government. So the tradition of chiefs in Palau, and the court did, because the Constitution of Palau says all government must be the public important part. And then, so, and, and thank you for that. That's really enlightening. One thing that I, I'll close with this. Um, these constitutional questions are, are challenging because we have the U.S. Constitution, which uh, is the law of the land here in the CNMI also, alongside the covenant and alongside the CNMI constitution. And, and so the question that I leave you with is how do we balance the rights and obligations of citizenship? What, what does it mean to be part of the United States and still be able to have traditions and cultures protected by laws here that the people wanted? Um, to protect, right, through the covenant, through uh, through the CNMI constitution. And so everything remains to be seen, depending on how what happens with the insular cases, and then what happens after that if someone were to challenge Article 12. Um, I think I'm out of time now, and so thank you so much for... Thank you.